Okay, I hope we're live right now. Um, super, super excited to, uh, super blessed and honored to be hosting and moderating this panel, Black Lives Matter panel with uh, Mammoth Hawks um, Athletics Department and some of my colleagues, alumni and current athletes. Um, just to start, I'm gonna have everyone just briefly introduce themselves and kind of go around the round table. Uh, Maritza, would you like to take the floor? Hello, my name is Maritza Darling Ramos, and I am the class of 2019. Um, I'm from the city of Chicago, born and raised. I We began a peaceful protest, and we had a peaceful march this weekend, and it became like a very nice, like, big Black Lives Matter movement. And I've just been doing a lot of protesting, a lot of rallying and, and assisting people with donations and stuff around the city of Chicago. So that's me. Bryce. Yeah, how's it going, everyone? Bryce Wasserman. I'm from South Lake, Texas, Monmouth University Lacrosse class of 2018, Masters class of 2019. Now I'm playing professional lacrosse for the Boston Cannons in Major League Lacrosse, and I'm also in law school at the University of Miami. Very excited to be here among some new faces and some old friends, King, Keem, J Rob. It's super fun to be here, have this conversation, and enact some change at our school that we love so much. So thank you for this. Awesome. Aaliyah. Hi, I'm Aaliyah Moore. I'm from Manchester, New Jersey. Um, I'm on the women's soccer team. I'm currently a junior. Um, I'm a proud member of the NAACP Youth and College Division of Ocean County and Lakewood. Um, recently, I've been going to protests. I recently was at um, a protest in Lakewood um, close to my home, and I actually had the opportunity to speak there in front of a huge crowd, and it was a great experience. Um, it was a lot of emotions and a lot of everything I guess you can say and I can speak on it later on um I'm just really honored to be here with everybody and I can't wait to learn and listen to others as well Faith hey everyone my name is Faith Blamon uh, Monmouth University track and class of 2017 I have been also protesting I decided to start a website where we give out scholarships, we collect books for students in need. Um, we have a mentorship program that we started. We have the Real Academy where we give people who aren't white education on Black Live, Black Matters. Um, we have the Real Academy for Black People where we reteach um, Black history from the perspective of Black people. So we talk about things like Black Wall Street, we talk about things like credit, um, owning property, things that Black people don't get enough of in our culture. And I'm just excited to be able to spark long-term change because um, if you follow me on Instagram, you know I've said it before, I want us to be the last generation that has to protest this kind of thing. That's real. Coach Rice. Hello, everybody. I'm uh, King Rice. I'm the men's basketball coach. I'm from Binghamton, New York. I'm 51 years old. Uh, I, I think this is incredible uh, that I get to be on here with you. I'm anxious to learn. Uh, as I talked to everybody earlier, I'm kind of the old head in the group, and uh, I'm so anxious to learn and hear from you and, and hopefully try to spark a change and continue what, what's going on just to continue to try to help young men and women of color to have a better world. <clears throat> Taylor. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Taylor Emmel. I'm from Mainline, New Jersey. Uh, and I'm currently on the women's lacrosse team. And uh, I'm very, very excited to get to speak to everyone, learn about their experiences, and learn how I can have multiple conversations with uh, my loved ones and my family and my friends to help better bring us all together. Talitha. <laughs> Hey, everybody. I'm Lisa Vickers. I um, went to Monmouth University. I was on the track and field team. Um, also served as captain and in various roles for community service. Um, currently, I am um, one of the main anchors for NBC affiliate WXI 12 News in North Carolina. But I was born in New York, Brooklyn, Brooklyn. <laughs> and <laughs> at this what I've been seeing happening in my hometown 
and the experiences that I've had um, at, in New Jersey at Monmouth University um, have really been weighing heavily on my heart with um, everything that's happening in the climate of our nation, the climate of our newsrooms, the climate of our um, athletes um, and athletic associations across the board, the climate of our communities. And I'm so honored and I really appreciate the opportunity to be able to come here and share my thoughts from a news perspective, but also an athlete's perspective, a student, a former student athlete. J-Rob. Hey everybody, I'm Justin Robinson, uh, Monmouth University basketball class of 2017. Um, I'm basically just here to be a voice and, you know, provide any insight information because I've been through a few things, but I'm also also always learning. So, you know, I just want to help spark a conversation and push, push forward. That's real. And lastly, myself, my name is Hakeem Vallis. Um, um, Monmouth University football class of 2015. Um, I feel a great deal of responsibility and simply honored to one be surrounded by my peers and colleagues um, to have this conversation, incite this conversation, and one take input from all angles uh, to see how we can make a better change here at Monmouth. So to get started with uh, our panel here, um, I'm actually going to open the floor up with Coach Rice. Um, so over the last few days, um, when I got instructed to uh, help moderate this panel, I decided to just, you know, take on thoughts, insights, experiences that have happened to other student athletes here on campus um, besides this, this panel, which we're going to get into next. Um, but one of the things that seemed to be a recurring theme uh, is, happens to be lack of accountability, uh, whether that's from the student athlete's perspective or whether that's from the, you know, coaches and administration perspective, um, you know, citing specific examples where a student was called a nigger by one of their teammates, and that student athlete, you know, one wasn't dealt with, was, you know, went through the the levels of administration from that sort. But moving forward, you know, how does the faculty plan on addressing? and just holding one athlete accountable and holding just everyone to the same standard of accountability. So one athletes are seeing some sort of change. So well, first off, <clears throat> for someone to, to call someone that it is terrible, it's hurtful, it, it's a lot of things. Um, and for it to be on our campus, obviously I, I don't wanna hear that. I, I don't like it. Um, but to, to make change, you know, what if it happened on my team, if it happened on my team, I think what I would do first is I would address it with my players. I would address it with the people that were involved in it, myself first, and, and, and just let them know, first off, that is so offensive and, and you shouldn't say it. And then I'd probably ask, you know, why would you say it? Okay, because I think people just throw words out sometimes and they don't even understand. And, and they'll just say things because they heard it or, or other people think that's cool when, whenever. It's just not a thing that you should do. After I did that, I would move it up the line. I, I would probably talk to Jeff Stapleton first. And then I would talk to Dr. McNeil, our, our athletic director. And she's taught me a lot. She's taught me a lot about this since I've been the coach at Monmouth. And then the next thing I would say is when someone tells you that something has happened for our campus, believe them that it happened, first off. You have to believe them that it happened. I don't think people are walking around making up stories that these things are happening to them. So I think listen to, to the complaint, listen to the person, and then believe them first. Okay? And I think our athletic department tries to do that. I know Dr. McNeil does that. And I, I know our new president, if, if it got up to him, I know he would make, would do something about it. And then after that, I think there has to be transparency. Transparency. I, I think sometimes things get reported and supposedly it goes into someone's file and then we don't hear what happened and it's just in their personal file and then everybody moves on. Well, I think that would help us if, if things were, if we were more transparent just on this campus, 
if something happens and there's a complaint, listen to it, believe it, and then when when it's when you go through the the whatever the the steps are, then there has to be transparency so everybody knows what happened when that person did it. I like that, and I appreciate your uh, your openness and honesty to that answer. Um, now, I definitely would like to take the time just to open the floor to the rest of our panelists to speak on individually, uh, if you have an experience yourself, of just acts of racism that you've seen personally or experienced personally hand in hand on campus. And as a second follow-up question, if you do have a story to tell, what does it feel like, you know, as a student, student athlete, you know, when something like that happens and the university does not respond and does not take action on what happened there. So if you got something, just please, please chime in. Well, Hakeem, just piggybacking off of what Coach Wright said, in addition to going up those levels of chain of, of command, I think as student athletes, we have to stand together as well. So if you hear that and see that, you have to also jump in with your teammate, with your classmates to say, hey, dude, that's wrong. Like, you have to have the opportunity to um, to know at the end of the day, once someone is um, out of pocket, so to speak, or you don't say those types of things to people without even really truly understanding the depth of what that word means and the layers that that could have, and the impact that could have on someone, you have to have your teammates there to jump in. I know many of the student athletes already talked a little bit about you know some of the protests that they're doing now and the things that they're doing now, what are you going to do also when it's right there in your face on the bus or um, going to in the locker room? What are you going to do? Are you going to turn a blind eye or are you going to confront it head on? Because I can tell you personally, you know, I have been called all sorts of names. And when you have an army of people behind you that can stand up and say, hey, nah, we're not going for that. Who do you think you are? And flip it and put it back on that person so they feel like, you know, they are the one that's doing something doing something wrong. When you have that support from your other teammates, it goes such a long way. And when you say, Hakeem, like to explain like um, an example of that, um, I know my my roommate and I on two occasions, one being, you know, we were off campus um, at a party like many of you have been. <laughs> and um, they were playing some music that had the N word in it repeatedly, repeatedly, repeatedly saying it over and over. And we heard it and we were just like, guys, what are you doing? These are people who we've been in the trip with you know these are people they're a ride or die like they are the ones shoulder to shoulder when it's time to win that championship we're going hard for each other and then to hear you know other athletes that you thought you know were like your brother your sister saying things like that um it, it was really hurtful and we had to really just have a conversation we started with an email chain because we were so upset we couldn't even speak about it and then we went through and talked my roommate and I Marquita Hannibal and we talked to our fellow teammates and shared with them like how wrong that is and and how we felt about it and it caused some friction but it's a conversation that has to be had so I think it's administration but also student athletes stepping up to the plate too as well yeah I wanted to hop in on that um I actually have an experience. I wouldn't say it was necessarily like um, like me on campus. It was during a soccer game, a semifinals game, actually. And it wasn't mom and students. It was actually another team. I was playing, and a group of young white kids literally called me monkey while I was playing. And I, and I was really upset. And at the time, you know, I brushed it off, and I didn't – tell my coach but I really should have and the reason why I didn't share with her because I didn't feel comfortable like saying anything to her or even to my teammates because on my soccer team there's me and my teammate Serena we're the only African Americans on our soccer team and so like it's very uncomfortable being in the locker room with only seeing one person that actually looks like you and you know before um 
like now my soccer team, we actually had discussions about, you know, what's going on in today's world. We had to push for that. Me and Serena, we um, actually had a Zoom meeting with our soccer team because we felt like it was very important that we address what's going on in today's world because it affects our lives on a daily basis. And so now pushing forward, moving forward, if something were to happen, like I feel comfortable and I even talked to my coach about it now. And, you know, I wish I would have told her because instead of telling her, I went to my dorm and I was just crying all night long. And I was like, confused like what well, like why would someone call me that like I understand to probably get me off of my game it didn't work but it still made me upset because I know what that means so uh first of all I I love to hear that it didn't work and that you still did your thing even though you were called that and I agree um I feel like having that common ground is really helpful for me I had kind of like the opposite experience so I came to Monmouth University I was a thrower on the track and field team. So first of all, my coach was black and the majority of the upperclassmen that surrounded me were black. So I never personally experienced any acts of racism in within the athletic community just because I was surrounded by like-minded individuals. And I think that goes back to what Talitha said, where if you're there to stand up for your teammates, if you have those people that surround you and make you feel secure, it helps. But personally for me in the classroom, I felt like I was always discriminated against. I was a biology major. Um, I was the only, first of all, I was the only black girl in my class, every single class. I don't remember seeing more than one or two other people that looked like me. And so when, for one, one instance, I was in a calculus class and I was taking a minor in IT and I've been working with computers all my life. And I did a present, I did a project and my professor said, you can do the project any way you want, as long as you can plug in the numbers and get the right answers. So I plugged it into an Excel document, as most people who are savvy with computers know, you can do that. And she gave me a C, I believe, on that project. And I went to her and I asked her like, oh, can I check my answers to see like what I got wrong? And every single answer I had was correct to two decimal places over. And I asked her why I got a C and she told me, I don't believe this is your work. And for me, honestly, I didn't, I didn't take that to any higher institution. I didn't take it to anyone else because I was so shocked that something like that was happening to me. I didn't even know how to process it. And it's, it's me being the older person that I am now that understands like, yeah, it might've been racially charged and you should have spoken to her, um, to the Dean of the school. You should have spoken to someone else. But for me, I, I went into college at 17. So to go into college at 17 and have a 35 year old woman telling you, I don't believe this is your work. And I, I replicated the work for her. I put, I plugged everything into an Excel document. She still wouldn't give it to this day. I got to think of B minus in the class because of that project, but just things like that. I understand that we're supposed to seek out help, but college kids are still kids. We have the title of adults because we're over 18 years old, but there's no reason we should be faced by racism and all of that other things and have to worry about that in addition to being a student athlete in addition for me being first generation in addition to all the things that we have going on there's no reason that there should be a place for that on any on any campus we pay way too much money scholarship or not to go to Monmouth University when I went there is about forty six thousand dollars I believe it's about around 60 now there's no reason someone should pay sixty thousand dollars to go to campus and be called a nigger there's no place for it and it needs to start from the top. It needs to go through athletics. It needs to go through every department because there are people at the school for diversity and inclusion. But until we see black faces that look like us, we're never going to feel comfortable coming out. Sorry, I went a little, a little in there. Sorry. <laughs> that's, that's real. You got the, you got the floor for that. That's what this is all about. Yeah. Any more individual experiences? Well, I, I, I as I said, I'm I'm a little bit older and, and I deal with a lot of different things. And, you know, this past year, well, a lot of times, a lot of times during the season, people have all kinds of things to say. And after you've been through it so many times, you know what they're saying. So usually I've, I've gotten to a place, they just hate. So I, I have to get to a higher place and not, not let it bug me. But I it does. <laughs> and it does sometimes a lot. 
<clears throat> we we lost one game this year. One of the games we lost this year. <clears throat> during the game, I was complaining about some calls, <laughs> and this guy in the crowd just kept saying, "He must be dumb. <laughs> he must be dumb." <laughs> And I told y'all, my, my dad was born in 1922. So in his generation, that was the way <laughs> they, they picked on you. They, they, they said we weren't smart enough to get certain jobs. So during that game, that one hit me and it hit me wrong. <laughs> okay, and I tried to get the guy kicked out because I could feel what he was trying to say in that situation. It was way deeper than saying I was dumb. <laughs> All right, it was so much deeper, and and I wish I didn't let it get to me in that moment because I didn't help my team as much. It did impact me for two, three minutes. Well, we ended up losing by one or two points down the stretch, and that didn't happen during that time in the game. But like I said, I'm older. I've dealt with a lot of these things, families, and and different things, and it. At that moment, though, there was there, I, I could not keep it cool. I just could not. I tried to get him kicked out. I called their AD. I brought it to Jeff. I was like, he needs to leave, man, because I get what he's saying. That's what my dad sent me to school for, so I didn't have to deal with that. Mm -hmm. Okay? And, and it, we're just expected to be okay with it, and I hate that these things happen to you. I, 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 it, it hurts that it would that it would happen to you in the classroom. I told my team this week they are they are doing incredibly well because how they carry themselves, how they represent their families, how they represent their mothers and fathers, how they represent Mammoth basketball. We're winning because of them. We're winning because of you guys being at Monmouth. You guys breaking through on some things. And you already broke through before, and now you're breaking through in a, another field, being a, a news anchor. You are you are Jackie Robinson right now, and, and people just expect us to break through these things and then just be okay when people pile on you the old stereotype. So I commend everybody on here because we're we're going to trailblaze some more. That's great. I appreciate that, Coach. Anybody else before I move on? Yeah, the one I went through, uh, Michael Brown passed away. Uh, he had uh, I Can't Breathe, and then merchandise came out. I had the hoodie, and I spoke about it the other day on Twitter. And um, I was in class, and after roll call, about maybe about 10, 12 minutes into class, um, I was asked to take the hoodie off. And didn't want to take the hoodie off. I wasn't saying anything, and I was asked to leave. So I just left. And um, like Faith said, like when you go to school, like, you know, you're supposed to be an adult um, at 17, 18 years old. At that time, I, was, I felt like a scared little boy. I didn't really know, like, I know who to talk to, but I didn't really feel like, like I wanted to, you know what I mean? Like, it wasn't like I was comfortable. It was just, I kind of just like broken, like fell into a shell. And, um, like experiences like that, like obviously it builds character, but that's something that our generation should not have to go through. No generation should have ever had to go through it, but especially at this point where we're so diverse and so integrated, we definitely shouldn't have to go through that through our own campus. And um, Professor Claude Taylor really helped me through that time. Um, he was my academic advisor at the time. He helped me through it. And then I was actually able to go and talk to the professor and really break down really what the, the message behind it was and why I felt strongly about it and why it hurt the way it did when they came to me about removing the hoodie and removing the picture from Instagram because I was using my, my profile to really advocate for an issue that I feel strongly in. I agree with that. I still remember that time period with Michael Brown, Eric Gardner, Trayvon Martin, and I remember, I think it was the political science club put together a whole thing and we went down to DC and we marched and we came back. Monmouth University campus did not change. It was as if it never happened. And being a black person and just living in that world where 
There was no message from the president. There was no moment of silence. There was nothing that was done. Monmouth University just kept going about its day, just like normal. And it made us as black athletes on campus, we were hurt, we were angry, because if you have no problem with that kind of thing happening outside of the school, what if it was my face out there? Would you care then? And that, that's what offended us. And we went and we marched through Monmouth University. And I still remember people laughing at us. We were saying, we can't, I can't breathe. We were saying justice for Trayvon. People were laughing, people were snickering. I, I heard the racial slurs. I heard the comments in the background and it's uncomfortable and it's unsettling. And for me, honestly, I have no problem being the loud black woman because at this point, I feel like I've gone to, through so many things that I shouldn't have gone through as a child. A, a university is supposed to come together and foster you as you learn, as you grow, as you become your own person. And I feel like Monmouth University as a whole significantly failed me on that part, with the exception of my track and field team, obviously. That's real. I, I remember those, I remember that time, I remember those marches. Um, moving on to the, the next question. Um, can you guys talk about, you know, being on, let's say, a predominantly white campus, just putting it out there, the small stuff that we have to deal with on a daily basis, whether that comes from just small microaggressions, whether that comes from just the simple stereotypes, whether it comes from on the athletic field in the locker room with biases that are subconscious, probably from some of your teammates, some of them being conscious as well. But can anyone in this, in this chat talk on their experience of any things of that sort? I would like to say something. Um, so my, I came in in 2015 before Trump got elected and everything was fine. And once the election started to happen and people started to like vote for Trump, um, one of my teammates was from uh, a red state and was very excited when Trump was one of the main candidates for that state. And so she let out a big woo in front of me, in front of all my teammates, and I was the only black person. And it just felt very, like, very, very upsetting. Um, we didn't really have a good uh, relationship after that. I think after that, it was just very much wishy-washy. Uh, we just kind of made it focus more on bowling rather than being like an actual team for, for me and her. So it was really hard, especially during the Trump uh, campaign for me to like experience that, especially as a black woman in an all white school and an all white team. That's real. Anyone else? I've heard comments for, with regards to microaggression, people have said things to me like, oh, Faith, you're not really black because why? Because I sound like this, because I like, it's like, what, what do I do that's not really black? What is black? How do you know as a white person, how do you know the definition of what is black to tell me that I'm not black? And it's those little things like that. And subconsciously, as, it, as embarrassing as it is to say, like, I would want to do something or I would want to speak up for myself. And I'd be like, oh, is that too black? Like, and that kind of second guessing yourself that results from microaggression, it happened over and over, even with the new policy in the weight room that student athletes can't wear do rags and headscarves because of, because we want to appear professional or I don't know what it is. I understand that as a white institution with white leadership that you might not understand, but when black kids go to sleep and have to wake up for 5 a.m. lifts, they should be allowed to come as they are, right? So if a white girl can wear a messy bun, a black girl should be able to wear a headscarf. That's real. Uh, that's, uh... Sorry, go ahead. Go ahead. No, I'm sorry. Go ahead. I was just going to say some of the things that you all are bringing up as student athletes, I just want to, one, commend you for being so forthcoming because I think that, of course, the university needs to hear these layers. And I also want you to know that, you know, even, and many of you already do because you've graduated, um, that even in the industry that I've been in um, from um, the world of entertainment to news to also um, hospitality, all of the layers that you're talking about is no different in those um, industries too as well. So 
as hard as, and this is not to skim over what you're going through as student athletes by any means, I just want you to know that your skin is being made tougher and better for it. So you know how to react in those situations going forward, because even now, um, to this very day, I've been in situations that I look back on and say, okay, I know how to deal with that now because I was a scared and timid and shy, um, athlete, a student athlete, but those are the things that, you know, Moms University is its own little world in itself, you know, and the things that you're going through within that world of Mammoth University, um, the best way to put it, in my opinion, is outside of that is like, you're literally being thrust into real world experiences. And I can tell you from, you know, hair, having to burn my hair every single day just to, you know, make people feel calm to be on the news. I can tell you from having to, um, you know, adjust myself accordingly and think of like how I'm, I'm able to um, execute the things that I want to say, stories that I want to do within um, newsrooms at stations that I've worked at before. It's a struggle because you get looked at as, you know, those advocates within the university are um, are key, but also it's key for the university to have those advocates to be able to say, hey, I can go to X professor, X coach, or there's a student body, you know, board or president that I can go to and speak to about these things because outside of Mama's University, it's the same thing. Um, and I, when I was there, um, I remember our freshman year, we had um, six female athletes that, you know, we were leaving from, um, a, we went out to the club that night <laughs> and we ended up just um, circling past um, the, the mall there and we were going to the White Castle. And I waved, we placed our order and I waved to one of the seniors that I saw. I was like, oh my gosh, that's Remy. And instantly my vehicle was surrounded by officers with guns pointed at all of my windows, all of us, five, no, six women in my car. And um, we didn't know what was going on. We were told, put your hands on the wheel, take your hands off the wheel, come out the car, put the car in park. And we were like literally shotgun barrel in my face as a freshman. And I had no clue what had done, what we had done. And the only thing I could think of to say to you know, let them know. It's like, I'm a student athlete at Mom's University. My name is Talitha Vickers. I'm on the track and field team. My coach is Coach Joe Compagni. I, I, I didn't know what to say. That had never happened to me before. Long story short, what we realized afterwards was the officers were waiting in the bushes. There had been a robbery over at the mall. They saw us wave to Remy, who was a, a Black man, um, a senior, and he was in there with his friend, and they thought he was a robbery suspect. And we were the getaway vehicle to then take them away. I, I, it just made no sense. My car was searched. We were searched. We were in tears. And my first call, of course, was to my parents. And they're like, we don't want you at this school. Like, wh what's going on? And I say that, I bring up that story to share with you because ever since that moment and time having, you know, barrel right in between my eyes, cocked, ready to go, um, I, it's been really, really tough for me even to drive home down the Garden State Parkway and having a, a you know, a cruiser like pull up beside me wondering, okay, what happened next? And we went through the chains um, and thank God for Coach Joe and, um, and the, the team that, you know, embraced us and surrounded us. And we, you know, got together, we had forums and things like that. But at the same time, that prepared me also for the real world and the things that are happening right now. I never expected that waving to somebody, like literally driving while black, I would have my car searched and have, you know, my girls in the car with me and have a shotgun, like looking right down, you know, my nose at that point. Um, so again, I say that to say that these real world experiences um, that happen on and even in the surrounding area of Monmouth University, your experiences are going to make you a lot stronger and tougher. And, you know, for me, it made me very timid and it made me look at officers in a different way. But at the same time, I have family members who are officers. One of my good friends, Dan Uncle, is a police officer in New Jersey. And, you know, I know that that 
experience was what happened with me personally, but that they were, they are not the example of every police officer. I um, appreciate that, that, that story. Uh, if anyone else, does anyone else have anything to add into that before I move on? Well, I, I was, okay. was going to say that some of, some of the things are real world things. And I'm sorry, sorry that they happen to you in your classrooms or on campus. And, and we, we were in an environment where you didn't feel appreciated and safe. Okay, but when you go out into the real world, okay, I'm I'm the only black head coach at Monmouth. So every day I walk in the room, I'm the only one that looks like me. Okay, I, I don't feel any kind of way with that because I know I have the love of the people there, but I am the only one. Okay, and there's going to be situations where you might be the only one. And that's why I think finding your voice when you're young and, and being able to express these things will only help all of us. And it will definitely help the people that don't look like us because we'll make them more aware. We will make everybody more aware. And I'm, I, I just, I sit here and I, I'm looking at you and I'm, I'm so excited for the future because I'm hearing the things that I'm hearing from y'all. It, it makes me excited because I'm telling you, when I was 23, I wouldn't have been on here talking. I would have, I would have shied away from it because I would have been scared to say how I felt. And and I'm I'm so impressed. And like I said, it's gonna, our future is going to be right because of some of these things you went through, and it's gonna make you so much stronger. And you're not gonna stand for it anymore, like some of us have. Some of us have have watered down a lot because we felt like we had to. And I think this generation, you don't have to be watered down. And that's a beautiful thing. And I think it's important that we, we have Bryce talk. I, I think all of us, because this is, this is how things get changed. Uh, everybody, I know I have Rick Callahan on my staff and when we have these talks, he, he doesn't say much, but he has so much to offer. And, and I think all of us being on here have, have a lot of things that we can we can make Mammoth better, but we can make the world better. No, that's that's uh that's real, Coach Rice. Um, that kind of piggybacks into my next thought or question. Uh, Faith, I really really agreed with you, and you, know, you talked about you know the the microaggression of oh you talk white or you, oh you act white, but oh it's like how do I, I'm me at the end of the day, I'm unapologetically me, but attending, this is a question for anyone who wants to answer, attending a, a primarily white school like Monmouth University um, as African-Americans, like we feel like we have to suppress our identity just to fit in, you know, with everyone on campus. And it's, it's just a sad thing because we can't be unapologetically ourselves. Uh, I just wanted to start a conversation on as to just, you know, one, why do we feel that way? And two, how does it feel like when you consciously know that, damn, I can't even be real with myself because I'm going to make everybody else feel uncomfortable here. It's like almost told that you're not good enough. Like, for instance, for me, I wear my hair natural in its natural state. At Thomas University, I would go back and forth. But I noticed that if I was wearing a long straight weave, someone would hold the door for me or people were more likely to be kind to me. But if I had my hair in its natural state, there were always adverse actions. There was always that, that look that they didn't say anything, but it said it all. And I just feel like that, that kind of makes you, it makes you second guess yourself at every second of the day and it's exhausting. And honestly, if you think black people are angry, maybe if you had to second guess every single thing you said did, the way you reacted to things, maybe you'd be angry too. Yeah, I want to piggy off of Faith. Like, I feel like with me, I always felt that I had like a second identity kind of. Like I had to act a certain way because if I'm in the locker room and my teammates are having a good time listening to music and stuff and they're loud and everything, I don't feel comfortable being loud and excited because I could be perceived as ghetto 
or even in public, like I don't do certain things because I don't want to be put in that category of, oh, she's ghetto, she's loud and everything. And it's, and I, and it feels so uncomfortable. There's certain things that I don't do consciously because I don't want to put myself in that forget that predicament. Like for example, um, like for me, I'm not a party girl. I don't drink, I don't do anything, but a lot of athletes, a lot of like my teammates, people party and everything. So one of the main reasons why I don't go and the reason why I don't drink, because for me, I feel like if I were to drink or anything, say if the police come, I'm most likely the only black girl in that party. They're automatically going to look at me and I can be in more trouble than anybody else. Like I fear that. And I fear that because I actually have had a traumatizing um, experience when I was 11 years old with police. Um, I'll share a quick story. Um, I was 11 years old and my dad, he was working at the time. And my mom, she was asleep. My brother was asleep. Six to seven police cops showed up to my house looking for a family member. Um, I was 11 years old, just playing in my room. And I was scared because these police officers came out of their, came out of their car with guns. And so I ran to my mom to wake her up. And by the time they, I guess they saw me running and literally they came through my the backyard they broke down my door and I literally tried to hide in my my parents closet trying to cover on myself with my dad's clothes but you can still see my feet they literally dragged me and my mom out of our like out of our house and my mom she works for um she's a dispatcher and she was explaining to the officers like I work as a dispatcher like you have no right to come in to my home and everything mom's crying and I'm just so confused on like what's going on because it was like I was just playing in my room. I didn't I didn't even do anything. And meanwhile, my brother was still asleep in the house. They broke down his door and pointed guns at my brother's head. He was literally just crying like, "What did I do?" And when my dad came, he was he wasn't happy at all. But now that you know I'm older and I look back and what happened with um, George Floyd and like all these different things that is just happening to people that look like me is traumatizing because like by me running by my brother just sleeping it could have been justice for Aaliyah Moore justice for Damian Moore and that's where it's that's when it's like that could have been my dad that could have been me and when people hear that like that could have been me like that is so true and it's a reality that we face every single day I even asked my um teammate um, I asked her, I said, do you think about being white when you wake up? And she was like, no. Well, every day I told her, I think about me being a black woman in t- today's society. Because every day I have a target on my back. I can be perceived as something or that I'm doing something. That's why I'm always wearing mammoth gear. So in my neighborhood, when I'm going on a run, at least somebody knows that like, hey, I go to college, like, you know, And it just is so hard. It's so hard trying to put on like this image so you can be accepted. It's like you're, it feels like you're never good enough. Until so until a white person is in a black woman or a black man's shoes, they'll never understand fully. But what they can do is like how we're having the zoom meeting right now just listening, having empathy so you can have an understanding. Like, I can't change you, and you can't change people, but you can penetrate other people's hearts so they can understand you and where you're coming from. And I literally was feeling like, you know, I'm not good enough, I'm not worthy enough. But now that I'm learning my true identity as a young woman and I'm having support from my teammates and I feel open to share these things, it's like, you know, if you hate me, I still love you. It don't, it doesn't even matter, you know, but it does hurt. It hurts on a daily basis and it's our reality. I appreciate you for sharing that with you. Um, Bryce and Taylor, uh, this question is directed to you guys. In light of the events that have taken place over the last two or three weeks, um, 
you know, the world's crazy right now. The world is justly crazy right now. And, you know, being one, white student athletes, two, just being white Americans, what type of conversations, or if not conversations, how has your mindset shifted or just thought process shifted just in light of the events that have taken place over the past few weeks? And if not, what type of conversations have you had, whether it's with your peers, whether with your family, and how have those conversations transpired? Yeah, so I mean, I think first of all, I've had definitely a lot of thoughts swirling through my head, sitting here listening to all these stories, thank you everyone who shared so far. I mean, this has been it's been great for me to listen to. But um, I mean, first of all, I'm the type of person that needs to be said to my my friends during this is that the people that say, I know how you feel. I feel I feel for you, all those kind of things. Like, I know how you feel. I'm sorry. They couldn't be more wrong. You know, like, I will never know what that feels like, what it feels like to wake up being Black in America and and kind of like having all the, the prejudice and, and just people looking down on you and, and the stereotypes and everything like that. I will never, ever, ever understand that. And I think that a lot of people think like me, even though they may not say it. I know that I'll never feel that, but I do know I'll never be able to walk a mile in your shoes, but I do know that I will be there to walk next to you. Like, I, I know that that's my commitment as a person. I know there are multiple other people out there, hundreds of thousands of other people who are there taking that stand with me. Like, and like I said, I'll never know what it feels like, but I'm there to walk next to you so that we can make this right. Um, and so, I mean, for me personally, I, I obviously, lacrosse is a predominantly white sport, right? So um, I've had conversations with a few of my black teammates and. I, I'm a person of action, you know. Um, there was the the Instagram with the the black tile, the Blackout Tuesday, with the the protest taking that to Instagram and the Instagram stories of everything, and um, that just never felt like enough for me. Um, I, I wanted to to take it to action, whether that be protests, donations, conversations like this. Um, so I think that that's the the point that I'm in, you know. I mean. I, I told Mark Mormon this, but I'm kind of descendant from my grandfather was on the committee that helped Martin Luther King Jr. plan that march on D.C. You know, so he raised my dad. My dad raised me. That that's kind of where I'm coming from is this um, this place of this place of action. Right. Like I, I want to be on the right side of history and I want to help and I want equality for everyone. So I think that that that's what I need most. Um, I need to be in a conversation like this and. I know that I, I'm definitely privileged um, just how I was raised and especially the, the platform that I have now through lacrosse and as well as this law decree that I'll have in two years from Billy. I, I don't want to just post a black tile on Instagram. I want to be part of the change and I want, I want, to, I want to be part of action steps that will help um, kind of eliminate this, this gap between us right now. And so I, I, think that, I think that that's where I'm at. And I, I'm excited to be here. So, I mean, I guess my advice for everyone else just like, with your white friends, like I, I'm here ready for action. So if you want to, if you want to talk to me about something, something that I can do, something to donate to, something to be a part of, um, I'm here for it, and I know that a lot of people like me are as well. Oh uh, yeah, I also agree with that, Bryce. I think coming from a predominantly white sport where you see lack of representation and people that don't necessarily feel comfortable speaking up for themselves. I think that in today in today's society, I think the, the real problem is being uncomfortable with having that conversation. And I think a lot of people who are privileged don't want to have that conversation. But I think moving forward in today's generation, I think that, you know, no matter what you believe in, I think that it's very important that we have those conversations with people that don't know what people of color are going through in today's society. Um, I personally have had a lot of uncomfortable conversations with a lot of family members that they weren't too happy with uh, the things that I said, but either way, if they, if they think badly of me because of stuff that's going on and how I feel about it and how passionate I am of giving a voice to those uh, in need right now, I think that my passion for that um, is deeper to me than you know what their opinions of me might be. Um, 
And I think all of you are so brave for sharing your stories and um, I enjoy listening to every single one. And I love learning about how I can help uh, as a white person in America. Um, my dad, he was a cop um, in Kenner City, near Atlantic City for 25 years. And so I've got to hear a lot of his opinions on what's going on right now. And so it's helped me kind of gain, you know, insight from both sides as well as having conversations with a lot of my friends who are also people with color. Um, I think just educating those around you uh, is the most important thing to do. And hopefully me coming from Plan Lacrosse, I think that moving forward, a lot of my conversations will be, you know, very blunt and uh, straightforward with those uh, that I don't think, you know, are treated out this fairly, especially on this college campus that is predominantly white. And I think that this, in light of what's all going on, I think that will, that is what I've taken from that and what I have to do going forward. Um, if anyone wants to chime in, please do. But I was going to transition this into, for everyone else in the conversation, one, I'd like to know why it's important for us to continue to have conversations with white people. Two, how to have those conversations with white people. And then three, what have your experiences been over the past two weeks, three weeks of having these conversations with white people? Well, I feel, um, you know, as athletes, we have coaches that push us to be the best that we can be, like on the field, off the field. And we know that being uncomfortable is how you're going to see growth. Being comfortable with being uncomfortable is what we're taught in sports. So this definitely relates to having the conversation, you know, even though that it's uncomfortable to talk about race in general, it's important that we do because we know on the other side of that is growth and that's where change is and that's where understanding is. And I feel like having even these small like Zoom calls um, with your teams or with your friends, your family, it's important to just have a small group. I think it's better as a small group because it's more personal. When you open it up, then you start to lose the crowd but when you have like a small group like this it's very personal i think and that's how that's how you really connect with others and build a relationship like just hearing everyone's story for those that share like i feel already closer to you by just sharing something like sharing anything you know so and i feel like with my soccer team um serena and i we actually reached out to our team because when Everything happened with George Floyd. Everyone was silent. No one said anything in our group chat at all. And in our group chat, we we're, we talk about current events or the news or people talk about politics or whatnot. And it just blew me and Serena's mind that no one said anything. Like this is something that is on the news on a daily basis. It's everywhere. And everyone was silent. And that's when I was like, all right, this is a problem. Because why it, it's a problem because I shouldn't have to just come to my black teammate and I can't come to the rest of my team about this necessarily. So that's why we wrote a very nice letter saying, you know, we know this is going to be uncomfortable. But we think that we should have a Zoom meeting and we should discuss about what's going on in today's world. And, you know, we're reaching out as your teammates, even if you don't support whatever it is, you know, support at least your teammates because we see you on a daily basis. We like, we're in the locker room, we play on the same team. And if we want to build an environment for our soccer team, where we are the values that coach says that we are trustworthy, hard work and discipline. Well, trustworthy, you got to know who I am so I can trust you and you can trust me. If I don't feel comfortable being who I am, then how, how, how am I going to grow? How are we going to grow together? So our soccer team, we had the Zoom meeting and it was amazing. We literally were on 
Zoom for like an hour. Me and Serena were sharing our stories. They were listening. They had questions. And it was an opportunity for us to grow closer and create um, an environment. You know, we know that the incoming class is coming in. My mindset was by having this Zoom meeting, it's getting me out of my comfort zone and it's getting them out of their comfort zone and letting them know it's okay to ask questions. It's okay. I feel like people are afraid to say the wrong thing. If you're coming from a genuine heart, if you just want to know something, nine times out of 10, it's going to be fine. Like there's nothing wrong with asking the question if you generally just want to know and you're not coming with any harm's way. So, and I encourage them, you know, just ask because I love you. I want to help you. And I want us to grow as a team so we can succeed. Yeah. You know, Leah, you make a really good point because um, exactly what you're doing with your teammates is something that, you know, I've had to also do within my newsroom and just in sending out an email and just letting people know if you have questions, I'd rather you ask than, than be misinformed or you know, go ahead and like, you know, hear and see things on social media, just ask, because if you're coming from a place of just wanting to know for knowledge so that you say the right things and you move in the right direction and you truly want to be an ally, um, then having an open dialogue, you know, I told them, I said, nothing's off, you know, off topic, off color, off base with me, anything that, um, you want to ask, do that. And I think it also goes back to being an ally. Um, and like Bryce was saying, like, you know, I'll never understand, you know, I'm not black. I have no idea how you feel, but I will walk with you. I will, you know, do these extra layers to make you know that I stand with you to end this, um, systemic racism. And I think, um, one way of doing that is doing your research. If you think about it, at the end of the day, we're in a pandemic right now. Every single person on this call, every single person watching right now has Googled COVID-19. Why? Because you want to protect yourself, because you want to make sure that your family's safe. Well, you also need to do your research and read those books and talk to your, your people outside of your normal circle to see and, and learn and educate yourself because I'll tell you, it's a, it's exhausting to constantly explain and explain and explain. And sometimes you're like, is it getting through? But I would rather have that exhaustion <laughs> because um, at the end of the day, if there's no communication, there were, everyone's going to be in their own little silos. I'm not going to be able to move forward. So the same way that you can go ahead and research a pandemic and learn the good, the bad, and the ugly of what this pandemic is doing we're going through good, bad, and ugly. This nation has gone through good, bad, and ugly. And we're going to continue to, to you know, be divided unless we have those real um, conversations. And I'll tell you that, you know, on my end with, with my teammates, they're my sisters to this day, you know. And, you know, we've been at each other's baby shower. They're white. They're black. They're um, of all different races. And, you know... My mom always told me, Talitha, you're going to make your best friends in college. And I'm like, yeah, whatever. But it's so true because I truly, my track and field team, my girls and Amy and Tara, Alessia, Jesse, like we're all Marquita connected and we're, we're, we're like this. Oh, and I think that stems back to anything that was going on in my family. My parents always invited them. So we're West Indian. And when my brother was having a birthday party or my dad, you know, we were popping the reggae music and they were like, oh, we don't, we don't, we don't know what this is, but we're going to dance anyway. You know, they learned about um, a different culture because my parents made sure that they weren't just my teammates. They, they were their daughters, you know, so they were an extension of our family. And my parents were so intentional with that. So I think we have to be allies, but in, intentional allies and not just say, okay, well, I blacked out my, you know, my, my Instagram and, you know, I did my part, pat myself on the back. It has to really be intentional to seek out those other conversations. And I, I, I do feel like, you know, with track and field, it's, it's a little bit different because Everything that Coach Joe did for us was based on performance. If you wanted to be on that A relay team and go to Penn Relays or to the Melville Games, it was about performance. And if you didn't perform, then you weren't on, the, on, on that big major team, on that big stage. And I think that, you know, how great would it be to have 
you know, us judge or, you know, looked at not based off of the color of our skin, but on our performance, what we can do on and the field. Um, and then just handing that baton to the next person, that baton of love, that baton of kindness, that baton of uncomfortableness, that baton of just passing it forward so that generation going forward will have a little bit more knowledge, a little bit more understanding. Um, and I know every, you know, every sport isn't like track where, you know, if you don't make the time then you're not on, you know, you're not going to be on that a relay team. Um, other sports may, may look at the color of someone's skin and say, well, you know, I'd rather have, you know, X, Y, and Z players, all black players, all white players. But I feel like at the end of the day with track and field, um, it's taught me so much to not judge people, um, and, and to be a, a cohesive unit and to learn more about my teammates because they invited me to their events. I went to um, so many of like baby showers, weddings, and I learned about their culture, but they also learned about mine and, you know, learning about that performance and, and, and basing things off of one's um, instead of someone's skin color and what they can do and what they bring to the table. Like, you know, <laughs> Reverend Al Sharpton was saying at the first memorial um, in Minneapolis for George Floyd, he said, you know, I don't need no favors. <laughs> you know, I got this. Like at the end of the day, I just need your knee off my neck. It goes back to like, we can do this. We just need an opportunity to be able to have a full playing field and move forward and show what we can do, but that comes with the conversations and that comes with being able to have an open dialogue. Um, I agree. Um, for the non-Blacks out there, if you want to be an ally to a Black person, yes, it's important that you're with them right now, you're donating, but you also have to understand that you can acquire all the knowledge in the world, but if you do nothing with it, it's useless. So with the knowledge that you are finding now, finding out our stories as Black people who literally walk by you every day, what are you going to do as a white person to be an ally? When you're in the locker room and there's no nobody around, what are you going to say when you hear someone else saying, you know, racial slurs or, you know, categorizing all Black people? What are you going to do when no one's watching? What are we going to do as Mammoth as an institution? Because I believe in institutions. So I believe that Mammoth University, why is it that there's only three black coaches and two black teachers? Is it because they're less qualified or is, it, is there another reason behind that? So as a white person, if you wanna be an ally, yes, you can give, yes, you can learn, you can do everything, but you have to make sure that you're not participating in the institutions that keep black people oppressed. Well, I, I, I you know, and, and my seat is different at, at Mammoth, okay? I look at Dr. McNeil and I say, Dr. McNeil gave a minority a chance that six other schools said no. So I think they're forward thinking. I think we had a president and President Gaffney that hired a guy that made some mistakes when he was young that don't look like them. So there's there's some things that, that Monmouth has to get better, but there's also a lot of things on this campus that are good too. And like I said, I'm always going to stand with Dr. McNeil because she has proven to me time and time again, she's fought for us. She's fought for women's rights. She's fought for everybody's rights. Back when people didn't even get to be an AD, that was a woman. She was first in the room, in the all boys club. She don't look like us, but she been in some fights that we don't even understand the, what she had to go through. So I have a lot of faith in her because she, for some reason, picked me. When a lot of schools wouldn't have given me a chance because I was a minority or I had some troubles when I was a kid. And that we had a president and an athletic director 10 years ago to take that chance on a minority that not a lot of people in the area wanted. They, they stood with us on that. Okay, and now I've been through a few presidents and President Leahy is, is sparking all kinds of things. I, I think he would appreciate these, these calls because he's a man of action. I can tell already 
just with the conversations I've had with him in a short period of time. He's a difference maker, you know, so I, I'm not here to, to just pump Mammoth, but Mammoth has done a lot of things. Some of the things that, that we feel, I felt at North Carolina, one of the biggest schools in the whole country that everybody that played ball wanted to go to. Well, we felt discriminated against there. Okay, we weren't strong enough as y'all to, to share our concerns because we, we at that time you couldn't do that. But North Carolina was a little more, the Klan walked through our campus. Okay, and I had to deal with that. I'm from upstate New York. I'm like, JR, let's go fight them. He's like, whoa, boy, that's freedom of speech, man. You can't go fight those people. They have a right to walk through, King, just like we do. Now, I didn't like that, but it was a valuable lesson. And I, I think, Mom, like I said, there's some things that need to get better. But I can tell you, I talked to the former basketball players, Mr. Cornegay. Could you imagine how Mammoth was when he came here? Okay, Mammoth made some big strides, some big, big ones. And there's always more change that needs to come. But we, we do have some people. Justin dealt with Professor Claude Taylor. I know we have some deans that reach out to our team to try to make young brothers feel more comfortable in a situation where you you might be the only one. But we have an athletic director for sure and in, in our new president. And that's not to say our former presidents weren't, but this new president, we, 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 got, we got some allies right now to really impact change on this campus. And, and I think by sharing like we are, they will feel that because no one should feel not safe on our campus. Nobody should feel that. And I wish you would have told me that you were going through some of those things and maybe I still want to be the coach at Mammoth, but I would have went in there with you and I would have stood right with you and said you, how important you are to this whole thing. Y'all are so important to this campus and that you're standing up and saying these things aren't right is really big time and that's how you make change. Unfortunate, this had to happen to make us get on this call because these things been happening. But now we're here. Let's really get together and, and move it forward because I think the, the people in charge of this campus are listening. Okay. I agree. Dr. McNeil is the truth. I have literally witnessed her go to bat for women. She's gone to bat for me. Um, and so has Coach Joe accompanied me. I really do think that um, when you look at it as an overall picture, you know, it may feel like, oh my gosh, we have no allies. But behind those closed doors, and I've been on both sides of it, um, I can tell you from Dr. McNeil, she is a pit bull. <laughs> she will fight. And she she um, has done that for me. Uh, Patty Adorna, um, no longer there, but she also did that for so many student athletes. And it's it's all about looking for those other voices. Like Coach Rice said, like, I wish I had known. Go to Coach Rice. <laughs> you know, even if he's not your coach, you know, he's going to hold your hand and, and walk you through it. And I had the Patty Adorners and the Dr. McNeil and Coach Joe Compagni, you know, going through so much when, when, you know, I had the guns literally in my car at a drive through <laughs> my freshman year. At the end of the day, they were the ones that stood up and said, this isn't right and facilitated us going to the fraternal order, order of the police to let them know what happened. Did anything ever come of that? I don't know. I was so scared. I had no idea. But it's those people that you have to seek out, like Coach Rice just said, like, let him know what's going on because if you keep it inside and then at the end of the day you're it's a pressure cooker situation you will snap on somebody at the end of the day and just like burst and i don't want to see that happen so and going to your fellow teammates who who um who who are seniors or that might um who you might feel like have more input or might be able to help lead and guide and direct you is is key okay. But still back to um, Monmouth University as a whole, I still believe that the white students on campus go out of your way to talk to a black person because if you do not know people, 
that makes room for ignorance. And the majority of Monmouth University has never seen black people or interacted with them. So if you are a white person on Monmouth University's campus, talk to a black person, get to know people, because you'll realize that you're not so different, that you have a lot more in common, and maybe you will feel more comfortable having these conversations. Monmouth is a great school, and the majority of the people are the future leaders of the world. So when I say I believe in institutions, I believe that as the future of the world, if you're going out into the world and you might be that only person, you might be the white person in the business room or the boardroom discussing something, whether we should hire this person over the next, just take that experience of interacting with people who are different from you and use that to be a voice, to be an ally when no one's looking. Yeah, that's real true. Um, anybody else about to say anything before I move on? So, you know, speaking, well, first off, let's be real, on the other side of this call, we've got Mammoth's administration here. We got Dr. McNeil, we've got the athletic department, we've got all those ears listening. So knowing that, for everyone on this call, like, how would you have like Mammoth University to have supported your black experience much better at Mammoth and or how, can Monmouth University make a change moving forward? What are tangibles that could actually happen? What are actionable steps that can actually happen? So I don't know if we're gonna to get to a level of satisfaction, but so there is a movement in the positive direction. How could Monmouth make a difference? I, I, um, I, I think more students, um, more minority students is a way um, I think that um, we do have a great school, but I think more minority students on our campus would help tremendously. But I, I, I have to say over my 10 years, my nine years starting my 10th year, I think that uh, I think this past year might have noticeably been the highest amount of minority students uh, on campus. Um, it seemed like that way to me. And then I think with the police, I think transparency on our campus will really help us. And, and I think for the students, the young minority students, I think please continue to speak up. Please continue, don't, don't get older and, and let your voice be, be pushed down. Please make everybody aware every single time. And Monmouth, Monmouth is a good place that I think the right people will will get a hold of it and make the changes that that you need to see changed. Yeah, I definitely agree with um, King Rice. I feel like because I even looked it up and maybe an old statistic, but seventy four percent of our school is white. The twenty four percent is minority. Five percent is black people. Eleven percent is Hispanics. If you look there, like a majority of African-American people on campus were athletes. So that's telling me like, all right, I, I'm only seeing people that look like me and they're athletes. You mean to tell me that there's not other African-American students or minorities that can't come to the school or like that we can accept and increase that percentage or even professors? Like I don't, the only, I guess, African-American workers that I see on a daily basis is dining hall or the student center. Those are the people that I'm seeing that look like me. And, you know, I have conversations with them I, and I, and I say hi to them. Like literally I'm playing soccer and one of the um, ladies that makes my sandwiches, she, she says hi to me and everything. I'm like thinking like, I don't like, this is weird. It's weird to me that, it's just athletes. And I think that I agree with um, King Rice, like maybe we just increase that percentage even more like that will, I guess, make us more comfortable, I guess. I think another thing that, you know, at least when I was there, it would have been nice to have, um, more discussions like this and having panels and bringing in speakers that can um, be engaging and making the professors 
whether it's as, you know, you'll get extra credit if you go and listen to so-and-so speak or making it requirements to, to, um, to go to different forums so that people can um, have that opportunity to hear from other people who might not look like them or having, you know, diversity days that, that teach people about other cultures. You know, I think that's really important, whether that's Hispanic culture, whether that's an Asian culture, um, just learning because at the end of the day, the world is, <laughs> it's not one culture, you know, and if we can, um, immerse ourselves in learning about other people. I think that's what, you know, my core group of mom and girls, like we, um, we learn about each other. We constantly are, are, you know, as moms now, we're, we're always talking to each other. I had one of my, my friends call me the other day. It's like, how are you explaining this to, to your kids? And, and what are you doing? It's like, well, my kids have black dolls and they have white dolls. If I show them now at an early age, you know, hopefully they'll be the generation that can, um, understand that when you see someone that doesn't look like you, um, you don't have to be afraid of them. And like, I, I'm not sure exactly who mentioned it, but someone had said that, you know, for many white students, the first time they are seeing a black person is when they get on campus or they, they might be in a suite with them and they, it might, they might feel uncomfortable. So what is the university doing to bring diversity and inclusion, not just from staff and, um, and, and athletes, but also bringing those speakers in, um, commencement speakers, bringing speakers to the table so that there can be another voice, but also um, having those cultural interactions. You, you know, you know, a food truck Friday with different types of food, you know, in the parking lot. I, I don't know, just just immersing yourself and learning about different cultures. I that for me would have been. Um, very valuable to to be able to have that on campus at least when I was there. I also think Monmouth University as a whole and probably maybe the athletic department should have somewhere that students can go to tell their stories anonymously. Like for me, I'm now because of Monmouth University track and field, I am loud, I am bolstering, but before when I was a 17 year old girl, I wouldn't have come up to anyone and said, this is what happened to me, even if I knew I had the resource. So maybe if there was some kind of like anonymous tip set in where students can just voice, hey, this is what happened to me, signed anonymous, and it made me uncomfortable. Is there someone I can speak to? I don't know how we'd work it out with them getting a response, but just a place where students can go and voice their opinions or voice their stories without fear of people judging them, people saying, oh, that didn't happen. Oh, you might have thought too much. Oh, is it's not all about race when, if you're Black, to be honest, usually it's about race. Anyone else with uh, ideas, thoughts for real change to happen on campus? Well, lastly, um, before I just open the floor for anyone to speak their mind, because I think we have some of the brightest minds that this university has seen, let's talk on a macro scale um, with the world. You know, the world is at a pivotal moment. You know, we're at its tipping point. Um, you know, I almost see, I'm not sure if you guys are all familiar with what just recently happened with Drew Brees as almost as a microcosm of America. Um, you know, you see something happens, backlash, further division. Something happens, backlash, further division. BS apology, we peep it, even more further division. I think, like, one, this conversation is, this means the world to me. I'm, I'm so grateful to even be here. I feel that, you know, as a world, it's, as a country, it's hard to move forward with our divisiveness. Yes, we're angry. Like, we're effing angry. I told Badger I wasn't going to curse, but we're effing angry. And I think, one, like, just figuring out as a world, like, I think these conversations are critically important. But I wanted to get some insight from the rest of the group on ideas and how you guys see, one, this world can actually take steps forward, whether it's as a country, whether it's as 
police reform, whether it's as small ideas within your community, what are your thoughts on how to make some real change within this work? Definitely mentorship, reaching behind you to help the next person. Because I know that I was mainly successful at Monmouth University as an athlete um, because of Coach Abe, who was always there to listen to me talk, even if it was about just the world or just understanding things. It was because when I came in, I had Tyler Young, I had Amber Brown, I had Kiana Hill, I had Laura Williams, and those girls made sure they taught me how to do my makeup, just like simple things. Like they told me, even when I expressed something that happened to me, they would tell me, you know, Faith, that's not right. This can't happen. And when I was finally comfortable telling them what had happened to me, they would speak up for me, even though if I didn't have the voice myself. So I definitely think that as Monmouth athletes, there needs to be mentorship constantly. If you are a sophomore, make sure you mentor a freshman. If you are a junior, make sure you're reaching back. Obviously, alumni, make sure you're a resource for the student athletes that follow because that mentorship is important and people don't know what they don't know. So unless they have a mentor showing them the way, they're not going to be able to succeed as, you know, as easily as they would like to. I also think I, I think we have to to make sure that we use all of the resources on campus. I, I think Monmouth and, and our, our school, I think we've we've gotten better. And I know sometimes I feel like my guys don't always use all of the resources. Now I, I'm sure the people on the call have used a lot of the resources, but I know if you if you go around campus and you really search, you you can find resources to help with some of these things. And and I think if we'll we'll accept some of the help, um, I know there there are things on campus and. If I don't make my guys go, they don't go. Okay, they they just won't go. Okay, there's functions. We had Charlemagne on campus. I think they brought him because that was like a hip thing. No, no students came. Okay, and it just it, it. So there's times when our school does some things to try to spark some conversations, but it might be coincide with people wanting to do other things at that moment. And then we just don't use all the resources on our campus because I, I know there, there's been deans that reached out to me. There's people on this campus that care so much about this. And, and we have to, to reach out and, and continue. And I know you ladies are at the front. You guys are on this campus and making a difference. But some of my guys won't, won't try to find the things that can help them on this campus. You know, and, and won't go sit like Justin sat with, with Claude Taylor because Claude can help you in that world because Claude is a professor and he's in, in academics and a lot of times he's the only one in the room. So just, just understand that Claude's not an athlete. So you could go sit with him and learn a whole nother perspective. But sometimes my guys are, he's not an athlete, so I, I'm not going that way. And it's like, you know, we, we got to be willing to, to try to find some of these things we have on campus. And then when it's not sufficient or it's not what we're looking for, then we got to be willing to speak up and say, this is uncomfortable. And that, I know that's hard sometimes, but we got to be willing to say, hey, I'm, this isn't comfortable for me. And instead of just pushing our own feelings down, we can say it's, it's uncomfortable and I need some help with this. And, and I'm trying to get my guys to do that more. On one hand, I'm pushing them to be this man that, that we do these things, but man, you need help. Say you need help. Ask for the help. And people will, will try to help you if you'll humble yourself down and ask for the help. That's real. Um, I'd lastly just like to open the floor if anyone else has anything to say. Um, You've got the ears of everyone. Oh, man, we just need to keep having these conversations. It's good to have alumni, coaching staff, and current students uh, to have these conversations. But it's super important that the current students continue to have these conversations so that things continue to spark and move forward. Because if the conversations die with us, then we've done our part. But at the same time, we fail. 
we need to keep the conversation moving forward so that we can continue to see progression. Yeah, I, I agree with J-Rob on that one, right? I mean, it starts with these conversations and then it ends with unity, right? We're talking about we want to end the we want to end the divisiveness, right? So I think on a micro level, it's not I unite as a lacrosse team, it's we unite as the Monmouth Athletics Department, right? We cross those lines on each team, we get to know each other, we have these conversations, and then you link arms and you're a unit, right? And then on a macro level, just as a human race, right? We have these conversations. Like I feel closer to everyone on this call just because of everything that's been said and shared. So I think that, that these conversations then need to start this unity that ends this divisiveness. Like I said, you know, kind of link arms and and kind of attack this thing with action. So I think that I think that's where we are now. So thank you guys for having me. I think within our own communities too, it's really important to. Um, find ways that you can personally make a difference and also asking people who might not look like you, what can I do to support you? Cause it's one thing to say, I don't understand how you feel, or I, um, I'm so sorry, or I wish this wasn't happening. Well, it's here, it's happening. It's been happening. What can I do to support you goes such a long way because then you open up that dialogue to the other person on the other receiving end of that to kind of let their shoulders down a little bit and say, wow, okay, here's what you can do to support. You can, you know, I'm here to answer any questions or just go through, you know, what are some of the ideal things like we've been talking about in this conversation, how we can support, how the university can be better, but outside of the university too, as well, finding ways that you can um, help people in your neighborhood, help maybe even your family to understand, you know, some of the things, because I know that there are people who have family members who are just like, ah, uh, no, I don't get it. I'm not with it. It's not affecting me. It's not in my community. Then, um, they just kind of tune out. And I think education is key. It's critical. Finding allies is really, really important, but also finding ways just to open the conversation and have um, that support and saying, what can I do to support you will go a long way for sure. Yeah, I agree a hundred percent with you. Even like with my own soccer team, like a lot of my teammates were asking, you know, like, Lee, what can I do? And I said, well, just by you being on this Zoom call with me, like, you're doing it. By you just willing and wanting to know, like, what you can do and just listening to what I have to share. And, you know, like, that is the beginning of change and how you're going to do something, you know? And I just feel like that's so valuable and why having these conversations is so important because it, like Bryce was saying, like, you know, he may ne never like understand what it is to be in our shoes, but he'll still ride with us. He'll still be by our side. Like by just having you, like Bryce has a part of me now, like he knows my story. So now he knows like, Hey, like this isn't cool. And he knows why it's all about educating. And that's why it's important to have these conversations with whether you're black or white and having these different conversations, because then you're having this wisdom and experience is it's so different. It's so different than just watching a video or reading a book. You have a live experience from somebody else and it's a heart to heart moment. And that's why I feel like I'm so happy that I had that Zoom call with my soccer team because I feel so like a relief. Like it just took so much off my shoulders where, where I feel so much comfortable to go tell them about what I'm feeling and it made us so stronger in just one hour, one hour of just having a conversation. And I just knowing that them reaching out saying, Hey, I see you. I I'm here for you. If you need anything, let me know. And just having my back, like, that's all I re like personally, that's for me. That's what I want, you know, and it, and knowing that it's actually genuine and moving forward. I know that my team by me just feeling more, and them feel more comfortable we're gonna just continue building on on the field off the field as people and I told them it's important that we have these conversations because when we have jobs you're gonna have people that look like me so by you just listening to my story and understanding things or any questions I'm helping you so in the workforce you know how to handle certain things or 
even I brought an example, like, cause we're all women, young women. I'm like, you know, eventually we're going to have our own families and children. You're going to have to explain these things to them. And it's going to be difficult, but at least you have this on your backbone and in your head that like you have something, you know, it's preparing you. So that's why it's very important that you take the opportunity and don't waste it. That's real. Um, well, just to wrap this up, one last thing I'd like to say is black or white out there, do yourselves a favor and watch the documentary 13. Uh, it's on Netflix, came out in 2016. You know, we talk about the system, talk about the system, system this, system that. But your average American does not understand what the system really is. And the history we were taught in school growing up is not the real history that one, us African-Americans have truly experienced. So I highly, highly, highly encourage everyone out there to take an hour and 20 minutes out of your day and watch that documentary. And lastly, I wanted to say a massive thank you to the Monmouth Athletics uh, Department, Maryland, VISC, Badger, all you guys, just for putting this together, allowing us athletes, current and firm, former, to have a platform to amplify our message talk about these things that are going on in our communities, on our campus, and how we can actually make a real change. But appreciate everyone else coming out and watching us. Panelists, really appreciated the conversation. Just like Bryce said, just like everyone said, I feel like I'm 10 times closer to all of you guys uh, just from hearing the testimony and just talking through these things with you guys. But appreciate you guys and fly Hawks. <laughs>